Good evening, wherever you are, and I hope it's cooler than when I, where I am. I'm Mark Ivanier, and as you can see, I have a fine haircut, a Larry fine haircut. It's the only thing you can get these days. Uh, this is one of my conversation shows. I'm asking people who I know and love to talk to to talk to me on the internet. Uh, the gentleman today is Kurt Busick. I have known Kurt for years. I have followed his work. I have I have probably not read every single comic book he's written, but everyone I've written read I like. He has a very uh, good sense of handling other people's characters and creating his own as well. And when he handles other people's characters, he seems to have a full understanding of what it is that makes the character wonderful and can pick up something wonderful to do with them that no one ever thought before. And when he invents things on his own, especially a fine comic called Astro City, uh, I just clamor for more and more. I've enjoyed that book tremendously. Uh, let me introduce my friend, Kurt Busick. There we go. There you are, sir. Thank hey you. there, folks. Good. Welcome. We've already got one email here, a message that just came in from Scott Edelman. says, looking forward to you two ripping off the Band-Aid and revealing the sordid underbelly of comics. It's right. odd he should ask this because we were going to start by trashing Scott Edelman here tonight. And, so. and, and that's, that's very silly. The sordid underbelly of comics has no Band-Aid on it. It's just out there for everyone to see. That's right. Yes. Um, anyway, um, Folks, uh, you can ask questions whenever you like uh, in the chat room, uh, but we will get to most of your questions unless they're really relevant to what we're talking about at the end of the show. And if you're going to ask that kind of question, ask it at the end of the show so they don't scroll off. I'll, I'll, I'll scroll in that Scott wrote the first piece of original art I ever bought. Really? Was, what was that? It was a page from an issue of Captain Marvel. Uh, with uh, the art was by Al Milgram and Terry Austin, and uh, so so it was. If anybody remembers, it was the page where Mordecai P. Boggs shows Rick Jones the uh, exploitative rock and roll poster that they're going to use to promote his tour, and Rick gets upset and tears it up, and uh, that was the first piece of art I ever bought, and Scott wrote it. Okay, have you done Scott's podcast yet? I have not. I have not. Every time I see pictures from his podcast. I think that being on his podcast looks delicious. Yes, that's right. Yes, it's very fine um, uh, food. Well, I picked out the place, so it would be. But uh, no, it was a lot of fun to do, and it was a, it was a great experience. And, uh, uh, and I got lots of nice comments on it. So I hope maybe, maybe, maybe you will have the same luck here, except that I'm not feeding you. Um, anyway, um, we have a lot of people you know online. Maggie Thompson writes... Kurt has been an agent, an editor, a publicist, and a storyteller featuring other people's characters, and he's created worlds of his own. What advice would he give people entering such fields today? That's a question I can just I can just sit back for the next hour and you can answer that one. Actually, I, I don't know that I have a good answer because I've been telling people for years have been telling me, uh, have been asking me, you know, how do I break into comics? And what I had to tell them is I broke in in 1982. It was like it was like a different planet then. Um, so all of the all of the rules that existed for when I broke in, which were like do filling issues and backup stories, they don't do those anymore. Um, so so my uh, my experience is out of date. I'm at a point now where if I want to pitch something to Image Comics, I can call Eric. So oh, the, we just had a weird interference here on the voice. Say that again, Kurt. Oh. Kurt, did you lock up here? You hear me? Yeah, okay, yeah, your picture is frozen on my screen. I'm not sure if it is on everybody else's. Just repeat what you just said. Okay, I'm, I, I, in the chat room, are you, hear, are you hearing Kurt? Somebody in the chat room, tell me if you can hear Kurt clearly or not. I'll keep talking just in case, you know, you need to. You, you just came back. You just came back. Okay. Okay. Shall I try to answer the yeah, question? Yeah. Yes, or... please. Um, I, I broke in 38 years ago. So the rules of how to break in are different, and I'm not necessarily experienced in them. Um, but to try to answer Maggie's question, um, everybody working – in the comic book industry. Everybody working as a freelancer in the comic book industry is a small businessman. 
And your job as a small businessman is to be aware of the market, whatever the market is. So in 1982, when I was breaking in, I had to be aware that the place new writers broke in was backup stories and fill-ins. Um, so that's what I pitched to editors who seem to need them. Um, today, somebody who wants to break in is looking at a world that's got digital first serials and web comics and self-published material and and of course the, the the classic comics and you know you can maybe do a mini series of something um but the market but what editors are looking to buy or what gets published and people read it's just a different shape than it was when i when i started and part of any would be a uh, creative person's job is to look at that market and figure out where the opportunities are because there has never been a roadmap. There's never been a system that says, do this and it will work. Um, even when Marvel and DC and other publishers had uh, had slush piles, you know, they had, you, you sent in submissions and, and uh, somebody, you know, some low level intern or assistant editor would be tasked with going through them and looking, almost nobody ever broke in through that system anyway. So when they stopped that system, there was a lot of complaints of people saying, well, how am I going to break in? It was, well, you weren't going to break in that way anyway. So the fact that it's not there anymore doesn't hurt you. You have to look and see where are the new creators coming from? What are they doing? And how do you do that too? The, the slush pile, first of all, is usually slush. Yes. And the person who reads it is usually the guy who wants the job more than you do <laughs> that you want. So, yes. so there's not a huge incentive for them to go, my God, hire this person uh, for a book. In fact, uh, I think there were people in, at, at times at companies who volunteered for the slush pile so they could read, eliminate competition. Uh, but I, I seriously, when I was starting out at Marvel, I saw submissions in the slush pile and some of them were literally written in magic marker on shopping bags it's it's you know when you're when you're um competing for an assignment in the comics industry you are not competing with other people who who want to break in because most of them are never going to get anywhere you're competing with the people who are already in and you have to be better than um, or and or um, uh, easier to work with than the people who are already there. It doesn't matter who else is trying to get in. It matters who's already there. Well, it struck me that a lot of people would be sending in book length Batman and Superman stories at a time when, you know, the top writers at both companies were fighting to get Superman and Batman yeah. and, or Spider-Man, whatever it was. And also I frequently got, um, I, I saw people auditioning for jobs that weren't there. Like when when I was made editor of the Blackhawk comic at DC, people started submitting Blackhawk scripts to me as if I'm going to go, yeah, I'll get rid of the writer who's writing it now, me, and hire you. It's like, don't you understand that I liked the writing job better? It also paid better. Um, you know, there's you've got to find an opening. You've got to audition for jobs that are actually there. Now, I got in well before you. I was I basically got into comics in 1970, and it's a very memorable moment in comics because that was the day the Silver Age ended. The day I got in, there was no more Silver Age, no, no, no more of that innovation. It just ended, and I think we had like the Aluminum Age for a while with me. But uh, I got in through you know, knowing Jack Kirby and knowing a few other people and writing letters. That's another thing. There's an avenue that's closed off to people because there's no more letter columns, really. And and a lot of writers work their way up from the letter columns. Mike, the Marty Pasco and Mike Friedrich and and uh, half dozen, uh, Kerry Bates, I think, uh, at least found out how to submit stories to Superman from the letter pages. Um, I yeah. I wrote a lot of letters. I had a lot of letters published. I didn't know it at the time that this was going to help me out when I was breaking in. Um, but what I found out from talking to editors after the fact was that they, 
you know, they knew that if they had their folder of, of letters of comment on the latest Marvel two in one that they had to write up a letter column for, if there was a letter from me in there, it was probably usable. So from that point, they were associating my name with workable, acceptable writing. And so when I started to pitch stories, then they, they already had a reason to say, oh, I know that guy. He writes useful stuff. Maybe he can write stories too. Yeah, I had about 50 to 60 letters printed, in, mostly in DC Comics. And I was very proud of that until I got into the business and discovered that uh, they didn't get very many printable letters. It was amazing how few some comics got. Some comics got none. Uh, one of the thing, things a lot, I and a bunch of my friends did in the uh, 70s a couple of times was we'd sit around for a couple of times in Paul Levitz's basement and write fake letters for letter pages for DC, Marvel, and Warren. Absolute mm. fake fraudulent letters because there just weren't any or there weren't any that were printable. Uh, I also had letters printed where the editor rewrote a negative letter into a positive one and put my name on it because he needed a, he needed positive letters and he didn't have any. Uh, so I lost that that pride, but I also realized that I was part of a very select group that the editors, they recognized my name. So when I went to the D.C. offices, people recognized my name, mm -hmm. possibly because it's because it, Neil Adams said, because we've always argued on how it was pronounced. And you probably <laughs> had the same problem with that. Anyway, um, uh, and with perfect timing, my friend Tom Galloway has asked, ask Kurt about how he got on Power Man and Iron Fist. Well, go ahead. Uh, hey, how'd you get on Power Man and Iron Fist? I literally, this, this, this falls into the category of what we're talking about. Um, I had sold a couple of stories to DC, um, but you know, they were backup stories. They weren't going to really pay my rent. Um, uh, but I was working for um, a magazine called Comics Feature. I was their New York correspondent, and what that meant at the time was that every week I would go to the Marvel press conference. This was back when Marvel actually had press conferences, and I would tape the press conferences. They announced who was doing the next issue of Marvel Team Up and if there was going to be a special cover on the next Spider-Man and things like that. And then I'd go type it up, and I'd send it down to uh, to Florida where they'd use it for the, for the news call. And every month it was announced that the next issue of Power Man and Iron Fist was going to be a story written by Denny O'Neill, who was the editor of the book. And it wasn't a new writer, who I won't name because he never did write any of them, but he had been announced as the new writer. And month after month, he wasn't apparently turning in any scripts. So I thought, maybe I can write one, you know, if Denny's writing these, these uh, uh, fill-in issues at the last minute, maybe he could use a little help. I didn't have any great ambition to write Power Man and Iron Fist. Like everybody else at the time, I wanted to write X-Men. But I knew, as you pointed out, you know, that was not a job that was there. They were happy with what Chris Claremont was doing on the X-Men. It was selling well. They were not going to fire him and replace him with somebody they'd never heard of. But if Power Man and Iron Fist needed a writer and I needed a job, well, maybe there's an opportunity there. So I wrote up a, a uh, page and a half description of a, uh, a single issue story where Power Man and Iron Fist fight Eunice the Untouchable in Times Square. And I sent it in to Denny with a note saying that I had already been writing professionally for DC. I didn't tell him that my professional writing for DC really amounted to seven pages at that point. But the fact that I'd been doing some writing for a, for, a, for a professional company probably made him think, yeah, okay, let's, let's, you know, let's read this. Um, and he called me up and he said, the story's not bad. Um, can you write it up on spec? And I wrote a full script and sent that to him and he bought it. So I pitched him another story and he bought it. And I got real, you know, brave and I pitched him a two-parter and he bought that. And uh, while I was writing that, I was still going to these weekly press conferences. And at one of the press conferences, they said, 
Um, and there's a new regular writer on Power Man and Iron Fist. And I thought, oh, well, <laughs> it was nice with how, you know, it was nice as long as it lasted. And then they mispronounced my name. So <laughs> the news that I was the new regular writer on Power Man Iron Fist came because I attended the press conference as a as a, as a correspondent. Danny didn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> how did uh, they mispronounce? How did they mispronounce it? I don't remember at this point. Probably Busiek, Busiak, um, uh, but my name has been pronounced many many ways over the years. Tell people the actual real pronunciation of it. It's Busiek. That's what I always heard. That's what I thought. Okay. Did you ever consider changing? You know, I guess you never did. All right. Uh, uh, you know, I did, but my mom would have been sad. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's my name. And I had all these letters published under that name. Why not? Well, who bought your first work from D.C.? Ernie Cologne. Oh, my goodness. Um, yes. Ernie, Ernie was not an editor for all that long a period. And Ernie's big... Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, I was going to say Ernie's big uh, claim to fame as an editor was the death of Iris, but that was actually Ross Andrew. Um, but 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 Ernie experimented. Ernie tried new things. Um, I had uh, I had taken a class in college on magazine publishing on the theory that any class I could take that would tell me something that might possibly be useful in getting into the comic book industry is a class I should take. And as part of that class, I had to interview the publisher of a major mass market magazine uh, as defined by ad circulation, that their definition of what constituted, you know, a, a mass market magazine was a certain level of ad circulation. And I, I thought maybe, you know, I, I asked the professors if I could uh, interview the editor in chief of a comic book company um, on the grounds that the ad circulation of comics back then was counted over the entire line. If you bought an ad in a DC comic, it ran in DC comics. It didn't run just in Superman or in Batman. Um, so the ad circulation of DC comics was substantial enough to count as a mass market magazine if you lumped all the books together. It didn't. It, it was it wasn't until years later that I realized they didn't care if I edited, if I if I interviewed a publisher or not. They cared if I, you know, thought about the business and understood something about it. But they said sure. So I arranged to interview Dick Giordano, um, and in, in uh, uh, Thanksgiving break, uh, I took a bus down to New York, and I stayed in a flea bag hotel in Times Square, and I. Uh, I interviewed Dick, about all the stuff that I had to talk about for the for the paper. Um, and at the end of the interview, I asked him, you know, if the, I told him I wanted to be a comic book writer if I grew up. And uh, he uh, he said, well, send me some, you know, send me some sample scripts. So I went back to college and I wrote about 80 pages of sample scripts for DC books and sent them in to Dick. And Dick apparently read them enough to say, well, they're not in crayon and they're not written on shopping bags. Um, and he passed them out to the editors of the books they were written for. Um, I wrote two uh, Superman related scripts, the Supergirl script and a Superman, the in-between years backup story. Um, and uh, they went to Julie Schwartz. Julie gave them to Nelson Bridwell. Uh, and Nelson said that they were perfectly publishable, but and the but in this case was uh, the Supergirl script had been written for Supergirl when it was a feature in Superman Family, and she was a soap opera actress in Manhattan. Uh, and Superman Family had just been canceled, and they were relaunching Supergirl in her own book where she was a college student in Chicago. So my script was not useful. Uh, and the Superman, the in-between years series had been canceled. So... I, you know, no, no luck there. Um, Julie did invite me to write a, a, a Superboy, uh, well, to pitch Superboy ideas. Um, and that didn't, you know, that didn't get me anywhere. I wrote a Brave and the Bold uh, script featuring Batman and Green Lantern. And the Brave and the Bold editor never read it. And I was annoyed for a while until I realized that the reason he never read it was he had a stack of inventory 
that would carry him for like another 18 months. But six months from them, Brave and the Bold was ending and was being turned into Batman and the Outsiders. So he literally didn't need any more scripts. And the fourth one, the fourth script was a Flash script, which I had written very stupidly because Carrie Bates had been writing Flash for like 17 years at that point, and he wasn't going anywhere. But Ernie Cologne read that Flash script and he said, this isn't bad. I don't need any Flash scripts because Carrie's right here. Um, uh, but I do edit Green Lantern and I need Green Lantern for stories. If I was smart, I would have known that going in and I would have pitched for series that that were kind of anthology type series that didn't have a, a steady creative team, but did need something every month. So I, I came up with like 16 uh, plot springboards for uh, Green Lantern Corps stories. And I, I uh, pitched them to Ernie and Ernie liked one of them. He liked more than one, but you know, he picked one and he said, go write that up. Um, uh, and I wrote it up and brought it in and he, he liked it. And I said, uh, my friend Richard Howell is in the office showing his samples around right now. You want to take a look at those? And he called Richard in and Richard, you know, so my, my first assignment was Richard's first assignment. Oh, that's uh, nice. And, uh, and, and onward we went from there. Yeah. And then Ernie was fired. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I didn't do it. Um, well, Ernie was a very wonderful artist. I don't think he fit in a DC as an editor. Um, but, you know, they tried something. They, they, they brought in somebody with a different viewpoint. Yeah, and then there was oh my god, he's got a different viewpoint. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that out of him. Yeah, he was the editor of Blackhawk for a while, and when they put him on it, for, for, Len was the editor of the first two, which Len Wein. Second issue was Marv Wolfman. Then Ernie took over as editor, and at no point did any of those editors ever read a script I wrote. I just wrote them and sent them to Dan Spiegel to draw, or whoever else was drawing the backups, and then they'd send them to me, and I'd edit them and send them in, and uh, uh, and Ernie would call me up to compliment me on the issue after it was published. He'd, he'd read it printed for mm -hmm. the first time. And uh, uh, one day they, yeah, and one day they had a meeting. They said, uh, well, we're, we're, we're taking Ernie out of, off editorial. Who are we going to give Blackhawk to? And Marvin Lenz said, well, Evan is already editing. Just give it to him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was like it was like we proved that you can do a comic book really without an editor. You don't really need one of them. But uh, anyway. Um, uh, We've got a few uh, questions here. I'm going to save for later, if I if I could here. Although, um, yeah, I'm going to save save these later. Uh, one of the things you and I have in common is that we turn up a lot on internet chat boards and forums, explaining to people who don't know how the business works how the business works. And uh, frequently, there are people; those are people in the business who ought to know how the business works. And many has have been the time when I've started reading a thread on Facebook or some other forum, and I go, "Oh, this guy doesn't understand. You know, oh, he doesn't get how this works. You no, know, he doesn't understand how the process works and things like that." And I start mentally composing the, the post I'm going to write as I go down through the thread. And then all of a sudden, there's a post from Kurt explaining it much better than I would and taking the, the job off my shoulders. I don't feel I have to, I'll, I'll just I'll decide, yeah, Kurt knows what he's talking about, you know, and such. And it seems to me that, you know, you can't, well, you can't expect people who aren't in the industry to understand everything about the industry. Um, and, and, you know, you, you're not supposed to, you, know, you per, it's perfectly fine to say, I thought the new. Um, your sound is cut out for me at least. Oh, okay. Oh, came back. Uh, okay, I'm back. It's we're gonna have this off and on for this whole thing. I'm sorry, folks. Just it might be better when you see the replay of this later. Uh, uh, I would I you, while you can't expect people outside the business to understand the inner workings of the business, particularly when people in the business sometimes don't understand the inner workings of the business, it does help to explain, well, there's a reason they did this, and this isn't the one you assumed. Now, for example, um, for some reason, people cannot grasp the concept that if, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use 60s comics as an example, but it's, it works for any decade. 
Here's the issue of Fantastic Four this month that Jack Kirby drew. Here's the issue of Fantastic Four that came out this month that uh, of Thor that Jack Kirby drew. And here's the issue of Captain America that came out this month that Jack Kirby drew. He did not necessarily draw those the same month. Mm -hmm. He could have drawn one of them six months earlier. They could have drawn them out of sequence. Um, uh, Jack was way ahead on some books at some times. And people are always trying to figure out, well, Jack drew this comic and then he drew this one so he's carrying over this theme here and go no no those were not necessarily drawn in sequence just because you read them in sequence or they came out on your newsstand in sequence people seem to not get that they don't seem to get that a lot of the assignments that are made in comics of writers and pencilers and inkers are done by oh we need to have this ink oh look Frank Giacoya just walked in the door mm -hmm. and that's the, and that is the decision to get that um, you can't shuffle the people around like you want to all the time if you're the editor of the book. You can't you can't make Wally Wood magically appear or Joe Sinnott magically appear when you need them. They have other commitments. They're not available. And that frequently the, be the person who is drawing a comic or is inking the comic or is lettering the comic is literally the best person who was available at that moment. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the person you wanted to have see the book, and things of that sort. And uh, uh, there's just this this, um, and people would think these devious things like, well, they took this guy. I'll, I'll tell you a story here. When I was doing Marvel Mania, uh, I was had to call uh, for a brief period of time. I you know, worked for the Marvel Ma fan club, and I read it to their magazine. So every month, I was supposed to call up Stan Lee. And get news from him. What's going on in the comics? And Stan was the last person then you would ask at Marvel what was going on in the comics. All Stan did was to tell me, hey, everything's great. We like you a lot, Mark. You're doing a great work, as he, as he would say to anybody. And you mm -hmm. ought to talk to Roy about that, because Roy was the guy, even though Roy did not have the credit as editor-in-chief at that time, he was really, in some senses, the editor of those books. So one time, I'm talking to Stan. And he says to me, hey, Mark, uh, listen, I, I really uh, uh, love talking to you. If you get any ideas about uh, ways we can improve our comics, would you please tell me? Just let me know. So for some reason, remember I was like 17 years old at the time. At that time, the Captain America comic was being penciled by Gene Colvin and inked by Dick Ayers. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a horrible combination. I just thought that was a bad mix, mix of penciler and inker. You know, I love Gene Collins' pencils, but not necessarily with Dick Ayers ain't them. And everybody who's watching this, who you know read comics in those days, has those teams they wish had not existed. Those matches of pencilers and inkers that they didn't like, and the ones they did like. They can all say, "How come this guy is making the book?" So I just, out of nowhere, I just said to Stan, "Hey, I think Captain America would be a lot better if Dick Ayers wasn't inking Gene Collins on it." And he said, oh, that's very interesting, Mark. Thank you. I'll look into that. So now I called Roy's office, left a message for him. Roy called me back about 15 minutes later to give me some news tips. And he said, Mark, did you say anything to Stan about Dick Ayers and King Captain America? And I said, yeah. I just haven't mentioned it to him. He says, he just, I've been trying to get him to change that, that for, for months. And he just came in and said, let's take Dick Ayers off uh, uh, inking Gene Cole, and the fans are demanding a better inker on that book. <laughs> the fans. Yeah, the fans meant me. Yeah. <laughs> Stan was reading the fan mail at that point. He meant me. So Roy thanked me for accomplishing something he wanted to do, and thereafter, Roy occasionally fed me, hey, when you talk to Stan, tell him <laughs> you don't like this guy on this book. <laughs> and Stan's, Roy's desk was you know, eight yards from, Stan, no, five yards from Stan's, but a guy mm -hmm. in Los Angeles was would say something to Stan and suddenly a book would change. It, it, the, it's so capricious how this stuff happens and how, how um, you know, a, a Chick Stone, when he started inking Jack Kirby at Marvel in the 60s, Chick wanted to pencil comics. Chick, Chick Stone was a lovely man who did not want to be an anchor of other people's pencils. You can understand how some guys might not want to. So he was looking for work, and he went to Marvel one day, because he'd worked for them in the past, to just see if Stan had anything. And he's sitting in the office, and Stan had a whole issue of a store story that had been penciled by Kirby and was had already been lettered. He was waiting for George Russo's to come in and pick it up. And 
while he phoned George Russo's, he let Chick look at the pencils, and Chick had never seen Jack Kirby's pencil before, and he was blown away by them, and just thought, oh my god, I didn't realize how good this guy was in, you know, in the pencil stage. And he, Stan calls George Russo's, and Russo says, oh, I can't interview anymore. DC's cracking down on me, and stuff like that. And so Stan hung up the phone and turned to Chick and said, hey, how'd you like to ink Kirby on Thor for a while? <laughs> and that's how, that is how the team of Kirby and Stone was born. Mm -hmm. And, and, and decisions are made like that all the time. And people think there's some master plan, something like that. You, you told me you just had another, you just were correcting somebody online today about something? Well, there was some discussion on Twitter. Um, uh, and uh, I don't remember what, what started it all. Um, but uh, uh, somebody was saying, you know, what we really need to do is uh, the publishers have to put uh, comics back on spinner racks in 7-Elevens and convenience stores. And and it's just like, well, the publishers didn't take the spinner racks out of the convenience stores. The convenience stores did that. They didn't want them. Um, and the reason that they didn't want them is because they didn't make as much money. I mean, when we, when we, when this whole phenomenon started, they didn't make as much money as a video game that could occupy the same space and not, you know, you can't shoplift from a video game and kids don't come in and read all the pieces of video game and leave them all bent and dirty so that they, they, uh, you know, they, 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 they don't look attractive anymore. Um, uh, so, there's this, you know, there's this rule about when you're digging yourself into a hole, stop digging. But a, another piece of that is that people think that if you just stop doing things the way you're doing them now and do them the way they used to do them, then all of a sudden it'll be like it used to be. And you say, you have to realize, no, because you've spent 30 years digging yourself into a hole. And if you just act like you're not in a hole, that won't fix anything because you're still in the hole. Um, if you, if you, uh, yes, if somebody else uh, said something about um, uh, why doesn't the American comic book market just do what Japan does and do comics that are aimed at, at, at all kinds of different audiences. And the answer, the basic answer, although we're slowly, slowly addressing this over time, um, the basic answer to that is the Japanese mass market for comic books didn't get destroyed over a period of several decades after World War II. So they always had comics out there on newsstands that were appealing to mass markets. And if they made comics for, for you know, 40 year old women, well, the comics were being sold in places the 40 year old women would see them and buy them. Um, and in, in the United States, we had comics on newsstands and when we moved from comics on newsstands to comics on spinner racks and then the spinner racks had a problem so you know we invented comic book stores and comic book stores the main clientele seemed to be young now aging men and if you did a comic book for 40 year old women in say 1972 40 year old women would never see it because they didn't go where it was sold um, so the shape of the American comic book industry is shaped by the history and decisions and made, mistakes we've made along the way. And the shape of the Japanese comic book industry is shaped by their particular history and choices and so forth. And you can't just swap them. Um, that, that, uh, that the, the factors that led us to be where we are today are still with us. So as we try to do new things, we have to figure out how do you reach the audience you want to reach? Um, we're seeing, you know, a, a, a huge amount of change in the comic book industry. Um, we're doing, you know, young adult and young readers graphic novels that are sold largely in bookstores. And those are, you know, those are going into bookstores where the audience for those for that material is coming in and buying books or possibly seeing them on Amazon and such and buying books. Um, but we didn't have that back in the eighties, you know, back in the nineties. 
Um, uh, that was a that was a market that we had to build slowly. That you know, back in the very early '90s, um, uh, Sandman was selling more and more. It was it was it was bringing in female readers. But if it was aimed specifically at female readers, it would have died because it wouldn't have lasted long enough to reach those readers without also appealing to the largely male readers of the comic book store. And because of Sandman and books like Sandman, we've been able to build new things that appeal to the audiences that they brought in and new formats that, you know, uh, that, that, uh, that succeed because of those audiences that we grew over time. And now we're seeing the, the, the results of that today. Um, but you can't do that overnight. You, you, you have to deal with the conditions on the ground and build from where you are to where you want to be. If that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it, it makes a lot of sense. I'll tell you an interesting thing about 7-Eleven stores. Um, I don't think I've ever told this story any place. Around 1977 or 78, when video games were just beginning to displace comic book racks, I guess that's about the right timing, something like that. Um, there was a fellow who I knew named Zeke Zeekley, who in the history of comics is best known for having been the ghost artist on the bringing up father strip for George McManus. And after he, that went away for him, he had a company called Sponsored Comics that did commercial comics, advertising comics, educational comics. It's a very nice company that published lots of stuff that um, uh, you know the mainstream comic market never saw. For a brief time, he did the PS Magazine mm -hmm. that uh, uh, Will Eisner had, had lost the contract to at that point. Uh, and Z came to me. Uh, and this, he was in talks with the 7-Eleven stores about doing a comic book that would be sold only in 7-Eleven stores, 7-Eleven comics. And he wanted me to edit it and put it together and package it and hire the artists and writers and things like that for it. And it would be a, a weekly comic. And, you know, drop by your 7-Eleven store every week, kids, to pick up the new issue. That was the premise of it. And so we had a meeting with somebody at the 7-Eleven Master Corporation I had a couple of meetings actually with them. And it was interesting at that point, 7-Eleven stores, I don't know to this day much about how they are these days, but when they were built, at least in Southern California, they were almost always built within a couple blocks of a school. When I went to junior high school, if you left Emerson Junior High School, if you walked two blocks north, there was a 7-Eleven. If you walked two blocks west, there was a 7-Eleven. If you walked two blocks east, there was a 7-Eleven. If you walked two blocks south, there was a 7-Eleven. And, then, and this was because of the traffic, and a big part of their income was kids stopping off after school to get a Slurpee, a candy bar, and a comic book. Or to release, you know, the comic book was also to be read while you were in the store. It was kind of an attraction. And Ms. Pac-Man machines were displacing the comic book racks. And the idea was, since they were all going, all the comic book racks were going out of the 7-Elevens, what if they had a little small rack on the counter that just had this one comic book? Uh, it was a, a very clever idea. And we had a couple meetings, and then they finally decided it wasn't going to work because the, the, the video game were bringing in so many more people. In the, they, they finally realized, we don't need comic books at all because mm -hmm. the, the Ms. Pac-Man machine took a, the same space as the comic book rack. It took less maintenance. It made more money. Um, you know, you didn't have to deal with returns, all that things like that. So that whole idea collapsed. It was, it was a cl very clever idea for about an hour or two there, though. Yeah. Uh, and the sales of comic books took a big plunge. That's one of the things that kind of put Western Publishing's gold key line out of business was the lack of the 7-Eleven stores and all those spinner racks that were lost because they did pretty well on those racks. Um, and, then, and then, fortunately, we had comic book shops that came along. Now, um, to segue here, yeah, go ahead. To, to, to jump off of some of what you said, that you know, the, I, I already see a couple of problems with that 7-Eleven idea that I'm sure that the 7-Eleven executives did too. One of which is, if it's a weekly comic, then it's got an on sale period of seven days instead of a month or two. No, months. They, we actually we actually anticipated that. The, they were, the, the, Zeke had designed a rack that essentially held four issues. 
Mm-hmm. It, was, it was like imagine Ooh, four, could be imagine four, four pockets uh-huh. on a comic book rack. Of four, it, this would sit on the counter, right? Or other right, places. That's the other problem. And so, and so you'd have the current issue, the last week's issue, this week's, and there would be like a discount if you wanted to buy four. It would be like comics are a quarter a piece and or whatever it was and if you wanted to buy four you got a nickel off or you got a coupon for a slurpee or something like that yeah, um, the, the, they, they were not intending these to be a pro to make a profit they were intending these to be a loss leader to lure people in and, the, and the, yeah go ahead the the trouble another trouble there is that counter space is the most valuable space in the store yeah. because it's where everybody has to come so you don't put stuff on counter space that's lost leaders. <laughs> well, they wanted to put, they wanted to put them on counter space so kids wouldn't paw through them and read them. That's true, so, but it meant that it was taking up space. Yeah, that could be used for you know gum. Or, it, it was it was an impra- it, it was an impractical idea, but it took of, it took three or four meetings to, for them to figure out how impractical. But to give you another example of an impractical idea, um, uh, there was a point in the in the mid nineties when Marvel decided they wanted to get back on on newsstands, they wanted to get back on those spinner racks. And they decided that the way to do it was they needed 99 cent comics. That comics cost two bucks then, and two bucks was too much for a kid, they thought. So they thought a 99 cent comic was the was the perfect price. They'd put them in 7-Elevens and places like that, and and moms would uh, would buy them for their kids and so forth. I wrote one of those comics. It was Untold Tales of Spider-Man. But they had a whole line of these 99 cent comics, and when they were ready to actually roll them out, when there were multiple issues of them done, they discovered that the dealers that they wanted to sell them to refused to take them at that price. That to them, having a 99 cent comic on their comic book rack instead of a, a $2 comic meant, so we're using the same amount of space to get half the profit. Why would we do that? And they did not want a book that was downpriced from what they were already using that space for. So. Marvel quickly came up with this idea that they'd take two of these 99 cent comics, package them as a flip book for a dollar 98, which is the regular price. And that would allow them to get on the newsstands. But it also wiped out all of that ability to attract, you know, moms and kids by saying, look, it's only 99 cents. It looked like it was priced exactly like the rest of the comics. The only place that those comics were sold for 99 cents was in the direct market that already had dedicated readers and didn't need an outreach line to kids. So the entire 99 cent line was a disaster because they didn't solve the problem going into it of, here's this great idea, we'll put comics, you know, we'll do cheap comics, put them back on the newsstand racks again, and they discovered that, yeah, but we didn't stop to think about whether the newsstand dealers actually wanted to use that space for a 99 cent item instead of a $2 item. Well, you know, one of the problems the industry had in the 70s was that a lot of newsstands did not want kids anymore because they were making so much profit off men's magazines, mm-hmm. Hustler and Penthouse. Those were a very major profit center for a lot of newsstands. And it was easier in some areas to not have kids to sell Hustler if kids weren't hanging around you know, paging through Daffy Duck comics. Yeah, when I when I started reading comics, it was 1974, um, and I was buying comics off of a initially off of a spinner rack in my local pharmacy. And literally, if I turned around and walked two feet, I was in the porn novel section. So so. I can't imagine that they wanted to have, you know, the, the 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 kids entertainment material and the and the porn paperback material that close together. Um, but it was the only available space, so that's how it worked. Yeah. Well, you know, now um, we were talking about uh, people misunderstanding, um, people on the internet misunderstanding things. Um, you wrote a very interesting uh, Twitter post. 
last week when when the DC comic book company kind of what's the word imploded collapsed <laughs> you know it seems like a like uh, a it just it all of a sudden they just suddenly downgraded the company to a fanzine publishing or something like that it, it was uh, the, uh, there was a lot of shock in the, throughout the industry yes and uh, people when were going around saying ah here's why the DC's collapsed they're not publishing what I want them to publish I've been saying all along they shouldn't be publishing comics about this or that or they shouldn't do this with the characters they shouldn't do that with them whatever and this proves that I was right and the point you made I'm gonna let you summarize it but the point you made was that it was not necessarily the content of the comics that was the problem yeah, I I um I saw people who were argue who, who were arguing that that it was all because of this variant cover on a Wonder Woman issue that at that point hadn't even shipped yet, um and they thought that this cover was insulting to the fans and it was it was uh, it ex exhibited terrible judgment and this is why you know somebody finally put their their foot down and ripped apart the the DC corporate structure and they didn't take into account that there were people at HBO and there were people at Warner Brothers that this, this was a whole wave of, of layoffs. It was not something that just affected DC. Um, and what was really going on was AT&T recently bought Warner Brothers. Um, and because AT&T bought Warner Brothers, they wanted to downsize a bunch of things and increase efficiency and do all the stuff that, that big corporations want to do when they want to squeeze money out of what they've just bought. Um, and on top of that, HBO Max, the streaming service that they just, they, they, they just rolled out, didn't roll out well. Um, uh, so there was a whole lot of money they put into that rollout that wasn't coming back in. And somebody said, well, we've lost a lot of money. And in, on top of that, we've lost another whole bunch of money because there's this global pandemic going on and nobody goes to the movie theaters and Warner Brothers is, at heart, a movie company. So, you know, people in order to serve money. Everybody I'm out. You're, you're locking up again. Hold on. Okay. Wait, wait one second here. Let's let's wait till you unfreeze. Ah, uh, he's just frozen for a minute here. I am. Okay, you're getting better. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, resume. Resume. Okay. If I signal you like this, it means hold Absolutely. on here. Absolutely. Okay. The the example I gave in the Twitter post was that. Several times, at least three times over my, my my history doing social media, I've seen fans, very interested comic book historian type fans, trying to figure out, was Ace the Bat Hound copied from Crypto the Super Dog? Were they both copied from Rex the Wonder Dog? And they were all looking at comics and trying to figure out which of these comics came first and therefore was the thing that the other comics were swiping. And they didn't take into account two names, Lassie and Rin Tin Tin. Crypto and Ace both appeared in 1955. Lassie and Rin Tin Tin both hit television in 1954. And before that, they'd been in movies. Um, Lassie had been in books. Uh, uh, Rin Tin Tin had been on radio. Um, so they were big names. So the idea that that is and, and and their Dell comics were selling very well. Yeah. So 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 the question of did you know was Ace the Bat Hound based on Crypto the Super Dog or on Rex the you know Rex the Wonder Dog? The answer is no. He's based on Lassie and Rin Tin Tin. <laughs> yes. Um, that that the point I was trying to make is that people who are interested in a subject in a narrow area tend to look just at that narrow area. And when something happens in that narrow area, they try to explain it without looking outside of that narrow area. Um, earlier, you know, you were talking about what do we call this wave of layoffs at DC? Well, at Marvel in the late 90s, I think it was the late 90s, um, we called it Marvel Cution. 
because there were just waves of layoffs. Every couple of weeks, there was another bunch of editors fired. Um, and, and Marvel went bankrupt. Marvel actually filed for bankruptcy. And, and people were talking about what Marvel must have done to cause this bankruptcy and to get everybody fired. And it had nothing to do with comic books. The comic books were selling fine. The comic books were making money hand over fist. Um, but the problem was that the new, the owners of Marvel Comics were using Marvel Comics as collateral. You know, they were leveraging the value of the company to buy other companies. And they saddled Marvel Comics with so much corporate debt to pay for these other companies that they were telling Bob Harris, who was editor in chief at the time, you know, profits have to rise 40% in the next quarter. And Bob would go, oh, my God, how am I going to do this? We've got to do 17 more miniseries, and we've got to put lenticular foil-covered covers on everything so that we can we can squeeze more money out of the audience in order to to service the debt that the, uh, the, the, the corporate parent of Marvel Comics is, is, uh, is, is dumping on us so that they can buy, I don't know, animation companies. Um, uh, and eventually that broke and Marvel went, you know, Marvel filed for bankruptcy, but it didn't file for bankruptcy because the comics weren't selling and DC, you know, you can look at DC today and you can look at the market and you can say these, you know, the, you know, the books are not individually selling the way they used to years ago. The line as a whole, when you take into account comics and trade paperbacks and hardcovers and digital and all that is making more money than it was years ago. Um, but regardless of that, the decision we're going to fire people at DC didn't happen because of anything in the DC comics. It happened because AT&T bought Warner Brothers. There was a global pandemic. HBO Max didn't roll out well. And so all of a sudden there was this huge lack of money that they had to address by firing people left and right in all of the divisions of the, of the corporation. It, it didn't happen to DC. It happened to everybody. Okay. Uh, I think that's absolutely correct for what it's worth. And I don't, and I think a lot of people at DC are kind of staggering around who were at DC are kind of staggering around trying to figure out, themselves what happened internally when the when the actual cause was external so you know the company will be will be back in some form someplace somehow uh, they may have lost some very good people in the process yes uh, along the time I I don't really relate to the current DC comics company that much I don't really see you know I, I, I was you know when I left their office I have to remind myself this is DC comics today it doesn't. There's nobody really there who. You know, I used to go back to the to to uh, the office in New York, and I walk around, and there's Joe Kubert, and there's Murray Boltonoff, and there's Julie Schwartz, and there's uh, you know, and there's there, or there's there's a lineage there. There's a you mm -hmm. know, there's the people who were hired by Julie Schwartz or Murray Boltonoff and such who are now now there. And I just don't know the people at DC these days that well. Yeah, uh, I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, that that you know i have been working for dc more recently than you have so i've been working with those editors and with those salespeople and and so forth and and uh you know it's it's on the one hand it's interesting to talk about what business factors caused all this but on the other hand you know a, a bunch of people i like are out of work and uh, you know thankfully a bunch of people i like are still at work um and in some cases like Marie Javins is now one of the editors in chief at DC, which is, I think, a, 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 an amazingly positive thing to have happen coming out of an amazingly negative thing that happened. Um, but I, you know, I know what you're saying in terms of, of, you know, your connection to the company and the material they produce isn't the same as it was when you were working for them or when you were reading the whole line as a kid. Um, uh, you know, I'm certainly not as connected to those characters and those books as I was when I was 15. Well, um, it, it is when I was 15. It's just 
that that I look and I, you know, sometimes I suddenly look at a whole rack of the current books or a box of them or whatever, and I look and I think there's 23 different Batmans. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's not a consistency there. There's, it seems to me like there is nothing wrong with any version of Batman because Batman can be anything at any time, you know, whatever, whatever. It, it just these all these different interpretations, yeah. and, and you lose whatever is unique about Batman. What's special about Batman? If if anything can happen in his comic, he can be in any world. He can interact with any other character. He can have any any amount of vulnerability um, uh, or invulnerability. Um, I can't figure out how powerful Batman is <laughs> anymore because in some story, in some stories I flipped through, he seemed, or even tried to read, he seemed to have the powers of Superman in terms yeah. of you know being, being you know thrown off the of top of a building and surviving and things like that and and being shot over and over again. Um, yeah, so, one, of, you know, one of the the um, uh, one of the great things about a character like Batman is that you can do so many different variations, so many different approaches to Batman um, and get good stories out of it. But sometimes I think you need to be very clear on which one's the main Batman and which ones are satellite Batmans, alternate um, interpretations. Um, that that uh, if you've got that strong base of this is Batman. If you want to read Batman, you read these two or three books and, and they're telling the ongoing story of Batman. And it's something you'll recognize if you watch Batman in a cartoon or if you see Batman in a movie, um, that that core Batman is going to be there. And then there are these variant approaches to Batman um, that you can see in specialty projects. But if you can't tell the difference between which one's the main Batman and which ones are the specialty projects, then all you have is this unstructured sort of marsh of Batman um, uh, where, where, you know, I, I, I was telling this to somebody, might have been you uh, just the other day, uh, that I think that, that uh, it would be good for publishers like DC and Marvel to say, look, I understand that we're, we're publishing adventures of Robin in the Batman comics and we're publishing adventures of Robin in young readers, um, uh, graphic novels. And we might be publishing adventures of Robin in young adult prose novels. And we're publishing adventures of Robin, um, in he's appearing in, in, uh, black label books that are aimed at mature readers, but, but at least the setup, for those adventures of Robin should be something like, let's just postulate off the top of my head, um, uh, Robin is a student at Gotham Academy and, and he's of course the ward of Bruce Wayne. Um, and at Gotham Academy, he's got a headquarters in the couple of the, of the, 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 the chapel called the Robin's Nest, let's say. Um, and he's got an ongoing, um, uh, relationship with the campus security chief that's antagonistic and there's a you know the the, the town near the campus has this river in it and so forth and it's and and it's used for smuggling I don't know um, but whatever version of Robin that you meet if you start reading Robin from that young readers graphic novel it has enough elements to it that if you then read a regular old Batman comic that's got Robin in it, you go, oh, it's the same guy. It's not necessarily the same level of sophistication of art or writing or whatever. It may be pitched for 25-year-olds instead of 14-year-olds. But as you graduate from one form to another form, you go, yeah, I'm reading about the same guy as opposed to, I don't know who this guy is. He's got the name of the character that I was reading about last week, but he's in a completely different situation and has a completely different personality. So I, I think that some sort of core consistency to the concepts and, and, and sort of status quo of the characters across the various interpretations 
would be helpful to make it all feel like the same character. And once you have that core, you can do your your science fiction Batman or your your uh, uh, Batman versus Vampires miniseries, um, and people will recognize that as yeah, that's this special extra Batman story. But the main Batman I have in these multiple forms in this in this thing. I'm not confused. I know what's going on. It doesn't have to be strict continuity between them. It just has to be. I recognize the character. See, I, I now and, and admittedly, I haven't put a lot of work into this. When I've looked at DC Comics the last few years, I haven't seen a, a Batman that has any consistency at all, or or a Robin that has any consistency, or a Wonder Woman really has a consistency. I mean, maybe I'm reading the wrong stories, or maybe I'm not being patient enough to read enough of them where I can see you know common traits. They may not be their individual issues, but. Um, you know, you know, one of the things that that is is always very interesting to me about these things. You, when you and I got into comics, there were people who had, if not legal right, they had some moral right to say what was right and wrong for the characters. There was, there were people. I mean, if Stan Lee said Spider-Man wouldn't do that, it meant something. Or if if uh, Denny O'Neill was doing one of his books and he said, I think this, and he had enough credentials on on that book. He'd been on it long enough, or he had, you know, handled those characters long. And he said, um, "This is right for this character. This is wrong." That had an overriding uh, uh, effect. There's nobody who has any moral credentials on Superman or Batman or Spider-Man or the Hulk anymore. It's whoever's in charge this week can do whatever they want with them. And no, it's it's the same thing happened at Warner Brothers in another sense. When Chuck Jones died, there was no one who could say they don't understand Bugs Bunny. Because he had a little special, right? Know, he didn't own Bugs Bunny, and he wasn't the first guy to direct Bugs Bunny, and there were lots of great Bugs Bunny cartoons that had nothing to do with. But he had a little credential, a little authority to say, Bugs wouldn't say that. Bugs wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And once he went away, there was nobody. Nobody's voice is more important than it. There's just the guy who's in charge this week, who the way these corporations go will not be there in six months or a year. I think. And, and there's all these different departments within. See, see, one of the things that's that always intrigues me is when you and I were growing up, reading comics. Um, uh, if somebody said to you, uh, "Where did Superman? Is Superman a comic book character, or a comic strip character, or a cartoon, whatever it is?" We say, "Oh, yeah, Superman's a comic book character who also appears in cartoons." Or that we could say, uh, "Donald Duck is a cartoon character that also appears in comic books." And these characters were linked to certain media because we thought of them as originating there or primarily being there. Today, that doesn't happen anymore. Superman is a character. To the audiences today, he's no more a comic book character than he is a cartoon character, than he is a video game character, than he is a character in live action films, than he is a character who appears on toys and merchandise. None of those media even have more, more, more of a hold on them than others. So the, the comic book division that at DC can say Superman wouldn't do that and the people making the current Superman movie would say yes he does we don't care nobody has control of these characters and it's I, the same, it's the same way I, uh, on my other panels here when we talk about cartoon voices we talk about how nobody is the voice of Bugs Bunny anymore it changes every time a new project comes up in a different division this, you know, Mel Blanc was Bugs Bunny and now nobody else will ever be Bugs Bunny the way Mel was Bugs Bunny and, I, think, uh, no. I think that takes a, a slightly different shape in comics, but I think what you're talking about, the idea that, that uh, uh, the characters no longer have a specific media home is something that, that uh, DC slash Warner Brothers slash AT&T, that's what they want. Yes, I know they want that, but the problem becomes that they don't even, they not only don't have a, a, a person, who has a little moral authority? They don't have a division that has a right. moral authority. Right. I, I think I think that you know, one you of, did Astro City to just take yeah. one book of you and Brent, and you worked with a few other artists on special projects in there. You were the final say on that book. You you understood it. Mm -hmm. I, I quote this all the time. Stephen Sondheim used to say that on a 
a musical, when he produced a musical, the most important thing is for everybody to be doing the same show. Mm -hmm. At some point, there's got to be someone who can say, no, no, we're off target here. This is the spine of this is this. This is what's right for this show. We have to throw this out. We have to change this. And we're all united on it. And, you know, you could have, you could have a team effort on anything. But at some point, there has to be, but everybody has to be doing the same show. Yeah. And I don't know that anybody, everybody's doing the same Batman or the same Superman or the same Bugs Bunny or the same, you know, th there's a guy at Time Warner, or I don't know if he's still there now, but for years he was running around saying they have to make Tweety a girl. Tweety Bird, you know, Tweety yeah. of Tweety Sylvester is much more merchandisable if we make Tweety a girl. We just, we're just going to do, and we're not going to like create a female Tweety. We're just going to say Tweety is a girl. Tweety has always been a girl, and we're going to do merchandise that proves Tweety is a girl aimed at girls. And that guy had just as much say as the people who were saying, that's ridiculous, we're not going to do that at one point. But these people, you know, they, they don't last very long. They yeah. come and go. Yeah. And I, I just feel there's a I, – I, I do not relate that well to uh, – Characters that are handled by everybody, I guess. <laughs> and the few times that DC has asked me to do things in the last few years, uh, I've turned down an awful lot of, well, an awful lot is would be say too much because I probably have turned down five times in the last three years where someone called me up and said, would you like to do this Batman special? Would you like to do this, uh, uh, you know, and sometimes they're, they're, they're Jack Kirby characters. And I don't even know who some of those characters are anymore because they've strayed so far from Jack's versions of them. And uh, to me, the outstanding comics that have been done in the last few years with uh, company-owned characters have been the case where some guy like would come along and do like, Mr. Miracle and that he's the only guy doing Mr. Miracle at the time and that, that Mr. Miracle, that version stands out alone for a certain time, Tom's version of it, and or whatever, and, and I just, I turned, uh, I turned on a couple of things because I just said I don't know who Batman is, and I don't want to read every damn Batman book that's been done lately, trying to figure out what what my Batman is going to be, or I don't want to add to the clutter of doing a Batman that resembles nobody else's again. Mm -hmm. you know? So. So and, and and I don't I don't anticipate much of a career with DC Comics in the future. I've I've turned loose of that. There was a time in my life, much earlier, when I would think whatever I was doing, you know, you know, if 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 I lose this job, if this TV show gets canceled, if this thing falls through, I could always call up DC and and they'd give me two or three books a month to write. And that doesn't exist anymore, any place. I don't think it exists for anyone, really, at this point. Um, but but I turned loose of that a long time ago. And if we're talking about comic books, I have to acknowledge for myself that um, uh, I don't want to be one of 90 guys writing a character. Yeah, I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to read a character that's written by 90 guys. This is back when I was writing Avengers. One of the things that I liked about writing Avengers, I mean, I was dealing with what was going on in the Captain America book, what was going on in the Thor book. There was, you know, there was a certain uh, cross connection of, of, of various books with a book like that. But there was only one Avengers book. And, and people would say, oh, we, we, we want you to bring back West Coast Avengers or we want you to do a, a, another Avengers book, mostly readers. And the editor and I were pretty strong about saying, no, we just want to have the one because we want to have one book done well. And, and, uh, and, and, and that's it. You have everything you need to understand. If you, if you have a West Coast Avengers, then you immediately start going, well, the really popular Avengers are these guys. So let's put half of them in one book and half of them in the other book. And then both books will sell, well, not as well as one alone would because you've split up half, you know, the most popular characters. Um, I just wanted to do Avengers. Um, when I did Superman, there were only two ongoing Superman books, which was a rarity at that time. Um, and I was working with another writer on the other book whose work I like and who we get along just fine. But there were still always these clashes of 
you know, what are you doing in your book versus what am I doing in my book? And I can't do what I want to do because of something you want to do. And and I it, it I very much creatively, if I'm writing a character, I want to be the writer for that character. The writer. Not one of a group of writers, none of whom can unleash their their full vision because they have to share that with all the others. Um, yeah. the, the only the only DC thing I project I ever had for DC I was really happy with was Blackhawk because nobody else was writing it. Nobody cared about it. We had I had a book that, that people would come to Nelson Bridwell kept calling me up and saying, Is your comic set on Earth One or Earth Two? And I said, I don't want to address yeah. that. I'm not going to think about that. And he said, then he said to me, if it's Earth 2, well, then Roy Thomas, we had to consult Roy on some things. I go, okay, let's take it to Earth 1. I don't want to consult anybody. Was, well, nothing against Roy. I just wanted to, to be left alone to do a book. that I did a, a crossover in uh, DC Comics Presents just to promote the thing. Uh, mm. I didn't think Superman belonged in Blackhawk anyway, but. You know, right, right. That was, you know, another good reason for it to be on Earth One is if you're on Earth One, there aren't there weren't any superheroes in World War Two. So, yes, so, right. so, 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 uh, you know, it, 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 it makes that, it much simpler. Yeah, that I was hope that someday, you know, someday if they ever make that Black Hawk movie, they keep talking about there will be book editions of your Black Hawk run because that's just a great set of comics. Oh well, thank you. I I don't expect them to ever print them. I I I was amazed they printed them the first time. I I never felt there was a, there was a uh, a uh, I, I have a perverse enjoyment sometimes of being ignored. But sometimes <laughs> you great things when nobody's looking at you. But um, I just uh, uh, what we do in Black Hawk. You know, DC put out a, a subscription. Did a major subscription push while we're doing that, and they did a. But a full page ad, actually a double page ad sometimes, in all the comics pushing subscriptions. And they listed every comic they were publishing except Blackhawk. They left it out. <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, and they, they kept forgetting to memo me. When I was the editor of Blackhawk, they kept forgetting to memo me on editorial memos. And I kind of enjoyed that in a strange way. It, it was it was nice because you you were I, on this little guerrilla operation. Well, nobody's looking at me. I might as well do something I like, and and that sometimes has an appeal. It was, um, it, was it was you. It was Dan Spiegel. It was his daughter Carrie, yeah. and who was it? Bob LaRose was coloring it. Uh, we well we went through a. <laughs> um, we had a problem with the coloring. We had an uh, enormous problem with the coloring, and uh, I shouldn't tell the story here because it would embarrass a couple of people. But essentially, we couldn't get a colorist that Dan Spiegel liked on the book uh -huh. until we got one. And then the people at DC said, you can't use that person because we have too many colorists who are out of work. You can't bring an outsider in. <laughs> so you've got to use one of our people. And they said you can use, you can pick, I'll, I'll tell you this part of the story. They can say you pick, you can pick any colorist you want as long as they're already working for DC. Because we've got all these people we can't keep busy. So uh -huh. you, you've got to get rid of your colorist that you found. I took the books into Dick Giordano, who was the editor-in-chief of the company, and I said, what do you think of the coloring on this issue of Blackhawk? And he said, this is great. Can I get this person to color one of my comics? And I said, no, they're taking home me. I've got to get rid of them because they're not one of your you know, usual people. So he, Dick could not overrule on that. He, mm -hmm. The head of the company said, this is the best coloring I've seen. You've got to get rid of this person. So I went to Dan Spiegel, who didn't like several of the colorists we had, and I said, Dan, you got a box of the current DCs there because they were shipping them all the books. And he said, yeah. I said, go through it. Pick out the coloring you want. Anybody who's already coloring for DC, you can have them. So Dan looked through it. He called me up. And he said, I did a Sergeant Rock annual. Um, and I thought the coloring was wonderful on it. Can we get that person? I said, well, who is it? He says, there's no credit on the story. <laughs> <laughs> so... I said, okay, well, we can we can now deal with that. So I called Bob Rosakis, and I said, uh, uh, Bob, uh, we've decided what colors we want on Blackhawk. Look up who did the Sergeant Fury annual. Uh, I told him which number. I think it was number two. I'm not sure which one. It was, I think it was the only one Dan did. And whoever that person is, that's who we want coloring in. He says, well, can't you tell me from the credits? I said, no, there were no credits on it. He said, what do you mean there's no credits on the story? We have credit, coloring credits on every story. I said, there's, there's none on this. So he looked it up in the files, and it was Jerry Serpy. 
uh-huh. who had been in D.C. since, you know, you know, since the original lungfish walked on land. I mean, he was, right. he was and, and nobody was giving him work at that time. And he was delighted that somebody asked for him. But they said, you know, then then somebody else called me and said, couldn't you use a younger person? You know, I mean, I said, no, I want the colorist that Ann wants. Give me that colorist. And Jerry was apparently very happy because nobody had asked for him for a long time. And he called the last batch of issues. And Dan was happy. I was happy. And, and it was the only problem I had with DC was over the coloring. Nobody read the comics. Nobody, or if they did, they didn't say anything. They just, mm-hmm. We just went through so it was it's it's very nice to, i happen to think that uh, when when it was a time years ago bob haney called me this is not long before he died he heard that dc was going to do a revival of metamorpho they're going to rev- they're going to do a mini series reviving metamorpho and he called up he said who do i talk to to try and get that job i should i created metamorpho i did the book when it was a top seller you know, they didn't call me. Why didn't they call me? And I said, well, they should have called you, you know. And he called up. I forget who he talked to. I, I put him in touch with somebody who put him in touch with somebody. And finally they said, well, we want a young approach to it. It, it was ageism. I mean, mm-hmm. pretty pretty nakedly. So they put the book out. And I, have, I, I do, do not remember who actually wrote it. If it's a friend of mine, I apologize. But it didn't sell very well. And Bob Haney called me up and he said, hey, I could have made it not sell very well just as easily. <laughs> And I thought to myself, what they ought to do at that company is take a bunch of these, these, um, for what of extinct characters, non-active characters, and just do it as an experiment. Give them out to people who just do what they want with them. You know, just say, okay, hey Kurt, we'll call you up and say, hey Kurt, um, we've got here. Um, uh, name an obscure DC comic that you that you liked. Man, hundred twenty seventy. Okay, Mike Sakowski, Manhunter 2070. Come here and say, Kurt, we want you to do six issues of Manhunter 2070. Just do whatever you want. Send the scripts in. Help you. you help pick the artist, and we'll put the publish wherever you want. We will have no input. And at that point, at least the point I'm talking about here, you couldn't have done any worse than, than if they had had all right. them. Right, right. They, might, they might have struck gold there with somebody doing it. Um, Right, and they, uh, they wouldn't have struck gold on all of them, but they but but as long as they got one, yeah, that's right. You know, as long as they got one series out of it, that it's like, oh, this is a hit. Um, yeah. But instead, at DC, you'd have things going on like, uh, you know, we hired this new creative team to do a character, and look, you know, they did this six issue miniseries and it was a hit. And now we're going to do them in the regular, uh, regular book, but let's fire all of those guys and give it to somebody else. Yeah. Um, and so the people who made it work are all of a sudden not working on the book that came out of them making it work. Um, so, so I don't know. Some of what you were saying earlier, uh, I, I also wanted to tag back to uh, uh, it's, it's in, in part it's that there is no single authority saying – I get to say what's right on this character. And one of the nice things on your Blackhawk run was you were pretty much that guy. Um, that uh, that for the extent of the Blackhawk run, you had a creative team that you could fit into a booth at Denny's. And, and you know, the four people that you were dealing with could make all the decisions and make a comic and you knew what you were doing and it was it was it was good and it was consistent and 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 it was on time. But um but but I, I think that uh, uh, something that we've seen over time as uh, as the direct market has has grown and contracted and grown and contracted um, is that that uh, uh, it used to be I mean when when I was reading comics in the seventies if somebody quit writing Fantastic Four half the time they quit in the middle of a story. And the next guy to come on the sto- on 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 uh, on the book would continue that story and continue all the subplots and 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 develop things in the same direction that the writer they just took over from, and they'd slowly turn in the direction they wanted to go. But that consistency was there, so that the people who were buying it on the newsstand, who didn't read the names in the credits, would say, "Yeah, this feels the same as last month." And and over time, it would it would uh, it would take on its own new direction with its own creative team. But once we got the direct market, 
and comics that were aimed at a knowledgeable fan base. And also we got trade paperback collections where you wanted a story that's self-contained or relatively self-contained. Then the value of continuing what the guy before you did and changing it slowly isn't there anymore. All of a sudden you want, boom, new issue, new direction, jump on here. It's a whole new day for the Cape Crusader or whoever else, the Scarlet Speedster, the Junior Sultan of Zoom. Um, uh, and and uh, everything you knew is wrong. Um, and here is a, is a fresh beginning that doesn't refer to what happened next month, or last month, because it's not going to be in a book with what happened last month. But the trouble with that is that every time you do that, You've essentially made this break from what you had before and you have this new thing now and you do it for eight issues, 12 issues, 24 issues. And then you bring in a new guy and the new guy sweeps away everything that was the bold new direction a year ago and does his own bold new direction. And then the guy after that, new bold new direction. And you end up with exactly the situation that you were talking about. Which one of these is the right one? Which one of these is the is is the main one? Well, which one is what, which one is this is the 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 set core one here off of which we will do our variations? Right. And I mean we can do our variations off them. We can we can say we can say these stories are out of continuity. I just can't find the ones that are in continuity for very long. So Right, right. I mean talking again about DC, I think one of the strengths they're going to have at this point is that Marie is very, very good at capturing the strengths, the basic core ideas of the characters. She understands them very well. But the thing you said earlier, that's great for the comic books, but the people in making the movies, the TV shows, the video games, or whatever, um, they're not gonna say, well, Marie, <laughs> how do you think we're doing? They're no, going to no. say, no, we're doing it our way. You may be in charge of this, but you're not in charge of the rest of it. Um, and so there, the, the, there may not be, you know, I don't want to make any predictions, but that, that, uh, that sense of consistency of understanding who the character is uh, just may not be there anymore. That in, in, in some stories, the Flash is a, is a sort of middle-aged suburban white guy scientist uh, you know, and in in other stories, he's a he's a he's a twitchy ADHD uh, uh, guy who's who, who who can't keep up with his own thoughts. Um, and you go, oh, is that Wally? You know, is this is this his sidekick? And it's just no, it's just it's just how we do him in this particular version. And he doesn't seem very much like the 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 guy you you uh, you read in the comic books at all. And it's 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 hard to know which is weird. Yeah, uh, let me say to the people who are watching us in the chat room, uh, we got to take about 10, 15 minutes here before we wrap this up. I'm going to now ask for questions. Uh, if you've asked them before, ask them again, um, and preferably not necessarily things that are vast going to start hour long conversations here. Do <laughs> you, have, do you have any questions? It's it's you and me. You can ask us what the weather's like, and we'll get a vast hour-long conversation. That's true. Yes, that's that's right. You know, you know, um, uh, Kurt is one of the people, one of the few writers I follow to the extent I follow any comics. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, Michael Saunders keeps asking us. This is about the fourth time he's asked us. Uh, how, how? Oh no, this is Tom. Yeah, let me do Michael Saunders first. Hey, Mark and Kurt, do you have any good Stan Lee stories? You got a Stanley story? I only have about nine hundred of them. <laughs> I have a couple. I, I, I uh, probably my best Stanley story um, is is how I first met Stan. Um, I had I had interviewed him for Marvel Age magazine over the phone, but I never actually met him. And the place and time that I actually met Stan, I was at the uh, at the San Diego Con. It must have been nineteen eighty nine. Um, uh, and I was there as, as uh, a Marvel staff member. 
Um, and when I got there and I unpacked in my hotel room, I realized I had forgotten to pack underwear. So at that time, at the base of Horton Plaza, there was a, um, uh, a department store. And I went to the department store and I'm flipping through their bins of men's underwear to find my size. And across the bin from me, someone's flipping through and I go, it's Stan Lee. <laughs> so <laughs> I introduced myself and, and, and said, uh, hey, Stan, I'm working, uh, uh, you know, I'm working for Marvel. I work with Carol Kalish. Um, and, uh, and he said, and you're buying underwear in Horton Plaza. And I, I, I said, well, I, I forgot to. I forgot to pack. And he said, well, I can say the same thing, except it was my wife. I blame my wife. She forgot to pack the underwear. So here I am. So theoretically, I can answer the question, Stanley, boxers and briefs. But let's let the man have some privacy. Well, you know, what Stan needs is he needs underwear that will hang loose and face front. So it's <laughs> it's here. Um, let's see. Oh, and Tom Galloway reminds us that Horton Plaza is currently being torn down. So... Uh, I hope they took the underwear out. Yeah, so <laughs> anyway, uh, Thad Boyd asks, any thoughts you'd like to share this year's Bill Finger Award recipients? I think they were all good choices, and Joe Gill in particular was a name I've been hoping to see. Um, for those of you who don't know, Kurt is on the board of, of governors or Blue Ribbon Committee, whatever we all are, that helps decide I, uh, that I, this thing I chair that uh, uh, gives the Bill Finger Award out. This year, we decided, since there was no San Diego Con, to not have an alive recipient and instead just give it to six posthumous people who we have a long, long list of people who've written comics in the past who we should honor. And we thought, let's knock off six of them and get them a, their awards and recognize it's knock off, knock off is, is too casual a term, but you know what I mean. And yeah. uh, uh, we had six, and, and Kurt suggested one of them. And, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's interesting because every year it's the decision is is unanimous we have no trouble coming to a reason smart decision we know it when we find it and uh we're very happy with the choices we made uh, but it was a lot of fun this year because we didn't just have two names we had six um and we got to do this whole you know online video chat where we talked about different choices um, and I got to make, you know, the case for Leo Dorfman. And, uh, uh, and, and normally the way we do this is you talk to everybody on the phone. So you're talking to everybody, but I don't end up talking to Marv or talking to Scott or, 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 or whatever, um, because it's all being fed through the, 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 the central supreme intelligence of Mark Evanier. Um, uh, and this year, we actually got to have that that uh, uh, chat room, you know, video chat discussion uh, that made it a lot more collegial and personal. I thought so. It was a, it was a lot of fun, and I'm yeah. very happy we gave it to Leo Dorfman. Yeah, I'm very happy that we give it to people whose names some people don't know, because that's kind of the premise of of the award. Were unrecognized, and I I I doubt most people knew all six of those writers. Uh, when they saw the list. And I got a lot of emails from people who said, oh, thank you for, this is history we did not know about. We did not know about these people and what they did. Uh, I loved it when we were able to get Joy Murchison to come out yeah. to San Diego for that. That, that it's, That's what makes the award worth doing. Is yeah, that, was, that was a very wonderful thing. You know, she and I were on the phone a lot um, uh, to... Uh, uh, arranged to get her out here. And, you know, and can you imagine having the best weekend of your life when you're in your 90s? <laughs> a stranger, someone you never heard of, calls you up and says, how would you like a free trip, first class trip to San Diego to be honored and applauded? And she was. She thought at first it was say, "You're so, you're so stu stunned by that, Kurt. You're freezing up at this moment." So I'll keep talking. But. Um, the, the, she was so stunned by this and, and delighted. And then she kept calling and asking, is this going to happen? Oh, how is this going to be? Is the, is the podium going to be that high? Is it going to be, you know, and just, I said, just trust us, just trust us. So the, the night of the, uh, um, the Eisner Award, she had come in and I was in a suit and tie and I went to her hotel room to pick her up. And for the first time, we, after all this conversation, 
uh, I met them in person, her and her husband, Jack, who was just a lovely, funny man. Uh, and it was just a great couple to be with. And they had, I just so delighted with how, how much they enjoyed themselves being out there. And, and here's this thing, when she wrote those comics, she never thought she'd ever be applauded for that. You know, we have, one of the joys of doing those panels at Comic-Con is like, I tell people at the time we had John Broom there at the convention he got the only standing ovation of his life and he got cheered by well you weren't at that were you Kurt the job uh, of the I panel. The room panel yeah I missed yeah. the beginning of it but I snuck in. Did you remember this moment? We had this whole room filled. I was up on the dais with Mike Barr, Julia Schwartz, Murphy Anderson and John and I was asking questions of John. And I suddenly looked out and I looked and there were an awful lot of people in the audience who I recognize as professional writers. And I said, just out of curiosity, let me see a show of hands. How many people have written comics professionally? And the entire audience put their hands up. Almost every single person there was a writer. And people who do comics don't come to panels usually. No. But everybody thought, this is our one chance to, uh, to, to see John Broom in person and thank him, albeit with just applause maybe, if that's all they could do. And I'm looking at, here's this man who, you know, we now have people in comics who get into comics because they want to be famous. They want to have signed autographs. They want to be celebrities. Or, or at least they know that is that is a likely byproduct of their careers. And John Broom never thought that. Nick Carty was so thrilled when he came out to San Diego. The man kept crying. He was so delighted. Every time someone came up to him and said, Mr. Carty, I love your work. I became an artist because of you. And I thought Batlash was the greatest comic ever. And he kept literally breaking into tears. He was so overwhelmed by that. And I kept thinking, we are thanking Nick Carty for all that wonderful work that he did for often lousy money and no recognition. And, and he wasn't treated that well by the business at times. Um, and we're giving back to these people who gave us so much joy uh, and such. And I, I just, it's a thing I love. And I, it, we kind of lost it now because we're now We've lost all those people who were in comics in the 40s and most of the people in the 50s and the 60s. And, you know, I mean, I have been to comic conventions with the person in the room, in the hall, who was in comics the longest was me. <laughs> it's, 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 well, luckily, it's, you know, awful. luckily before we got here, you got to bring a lot of those people to conventions um, and, and give them those moments. Uh, you know, these are often people you know, when they broke into comics, you know, they didn't get into comics because they wanted to be in comics and their name didn't go on the books. Um, uh, they just, you know, it was a job and it was something that they did with uh, whatever amount of pride they were able to bring to it. But it was it was an anonymous job. And and the the, the fan culture um, has been able to express an appreciation for these people that a lot of them got to experience in part because of things like San Diego and, and the, uh, the finger award and all. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Maggie Thompson just added joy Merchant Kelly was so wonderful and so happy to be there. And her fans were so thrilled. That is absolutely the case. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of, a lot of memorable moments like this. Let me go back here to, uh, 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 oh, okay. Phil rushed and asked, Kurt, what was it like bringing back Mike Sikowski to the JLA for one more issue in 1985? Now, I'm the one who got him to do that. Do and and that? I wouldn't have known. You know, the reason why that happened, um, I think you had mentioned in a conversation that Mike had some time on his hands. And yes. I, 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 you know, I was asked to do a fill-in of Justice League, and I asked the editor, Alan Gold, can we get Mike Sikowski? And we said, and he said, I don't, I don't think he does, you know, he works in animation. I said, well, I hear from Mark Evanier that, you know, he, he's, he's got some time on his hands. And he said, well, I'll call Mark. Um, and, and uh, you were able to, to put Alan together with, uh, with Mike Sikowski. And I got to, I got to do a story with Mike Sikowski. That was really cool. I have, though, the single greatest Mike Sikowski Justice League story. I, yes, do you know do. about that? Yes. I yes, I have. For those of you who don't know, Mike was a friend of mine, and at one point for 
just because he was Mike Sikowski, he drew a 12-page Justice League story in pencil. It's still in pencil. I have it. Uh, and it's basically all the members of the Justice League gang-banging Wonder Woman. It's a filthy, pornographic Justice League story that uh, uh, is is amazing. And I promised him I wouldn't show it to anyone. And I uh, let's see how long it takes me to break that promise someday. Anyway, uh, so far, um, I had just to to answer a little bit more of the question. Um, one of the, you know, I had a lot of fun doing that story uh, with Sikowski, um, in part because there was no available Justice League at the time. Uh, they, were, they were trapped on Mars or tied up in, in, in some story, something Jerry Conway was writing and they weren't available. So I was able to do a story where the Justice League uh, from the past was featured and it's you know, probably nobody noticed. But the Justice League that appears in that story, if you look at the internal cues of, of what they're talking to each other about, um, is the Justice League from between Sikowski's last issue and Dick Dillon's first issue. Um, so I, I, I was able to literally make it the next Sikowski Justice League, the one that, that, uh, that could have happened uh, had he stayed on the book for an issue and you know, an eight-year-old from Boston wrote it. Yeah, okay. Uh, Maggie asks, uh, you gonna wish Kurt a happy birthday in advance? No, I no don't he's not. No, I'm not. Uh, let's see who else we've got here. We got, uh, uh, um, oh, uh, Trevor Kimball is asking, uh, wait a minute, I'm sorry, uh, Leonard Starr. Uh, Trevor, you're talking about Leonard Starr here. Uh, uh, yeah, Trevor Kimball. Let us start. Thundercats was my favorite when I was little, so that's what I think of when I hear his name. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm I'm out of sequence here here, but the some of these questions. Star, uh, I think Leonard Starr is possibly the single best writer of American dramatic comic strips. Uh, in the history of American dramatic comic strips, he was he was absolutely amazing, and I go back to his work over and over again to look at how well he did things like uh, exposition. Um, if you if you read those strips, every three panels he's got to reintroduce you to the situation, but he does it in a way that doesn't sound like. And now the characters will explain the situation again. Um, uh, so it, he just, he just had amazing skill, um, uh, and, uh, a wonderful sense of irony. I'm not sure why we're talking about Leonard Starr, but as long as his name came up, I'm, I'm going to. Came up here in a, in, a, in, a, in a comment thread that I clicked on by accident. You know, um, there are certain comics, comic strips and comics and various series that I know people love them and I did just, I've never warmed to them. I tried them. You know, I used to try to. I used to for a while. Everybody I know was loving the Doc Savage paperbacks, and I would read. I read one. I didn't like it. And they'd say, "Oh no, you read the wrong one. Read this one." I'd read that one and go, "No, I didn't. I don't like this." And they, "Oh, you read the wrong one. Here, read this one." And I thought after about six of them, I go, "I don't think I'm ever going to like Doc Savage." I stopped reading them. I've always felt the way about Little Orphan Annie. I never. I, I kept reading Little Orphan Annie this year's, those, that decade. I never liked it. I actually disliked it in the, in the, in the 60s. And I thought it was a ter terrible newspaper strip. And then Leonard Starr came along and turned it into something. And the only, the only Little Orphan Annie I ever liked was Leonard Starr's of all of, all of them. Um, I, have, I have about the IDW collections with the Harold Gray uh, or Annie. Or I think I've got about 10 or 11, but I've read about six of them, and I haven't warmed to it. Um, but that star stuff, is, is, it's, it's so good. Um, great cartoonist. He's a great illustrator. He's a great storyteller. Dialogue is amazing. Um, I think that, uh, you know, Leonard, Leonard was at the top of his game for a very, very long time, uh, but I still feel like uh, he's underappreciated. Uh, because because not enough people uh, uh, in the in the comics world uh, 
think about him today and about uh, about the great work he did. Okay, we'll take here's a last question. Jamie Colville asks, "Where is Astro City within DC now?" It was under various imprints, but I don't know if they still exist. Wildstorm Vertigo. Well, see, we've got this character, the Broken Man, who's talking about the threat of the Ubor, and the real threat of the Ubor is he destroys comic book imprints. Um, uh, yeah, the character who has that name grew. <laughs> yeah, but I'm doing the superhero version of that. Oh, okay. um, uh, the the um, uh, as I mentioned to somebody, I think earlier today. Um, where is Astro City at DC now is a very good question. And I know the answer to it, but I'm not able to announce the answer to it yet. Um, hopefully, I, at the beginning, you know, before uh, Mark went live with all of this, he asked me if I had any, uh, uh, had any news announcements I'd like to make. And I, I, I had to say, I've got, you know, I got a whole bunch of announcements, but they're all about three inches away from ready to make. Um, so, we will be making announcements about Astro City and answering that question very soon, um, but not tonight. Okay. Well, Kurt, I want to thank you for taking the time to do this with me. I've been wanting to do this for a while. I thank you. Also, thank, thank you, you for putting up with me postponing it for a while when when I got swamped with things. Uh, for those of you who are who like these webcasts, um, day after tomorrow, which is Thursday, uh, I'll be turning the table, Sergio Aragonas will be the host of this webcast. He'll be interviewing me, and I have no idea what he's going to ask me about, but it will probably be a felony in some states. Uh, on Saturday, I'm going to do one of my, a panel called Business of Cartoon Voices with some actors and some agents discussing how to get into the cartoon business as a, as a voice actor. And next Tuesday, I'm going to be doing a webcast where I'm going to be interviewing the Pulitzer Prize winning political cartoonist Mike Peters, creator of Mother Goose and Grimm, and one of the cheeriest human beings on this planet. Uh, and, and, if you, and if your job was drawing insulting cartoons about Donald Trump, wouldn't you be happy to? So uh, anyway, we will, uh, and I've got a few other great people coming up on these in the future. So uh, check my website. Uh, if you missed any part of this conversation, and some of you apparently did, uh, this will rerun ad infinitum right after, there, there might be a minute or two after we sign off but it will then be available on YouTube or wherever you're watching this now to watch anytime you feel like. Um, and Kurt, thank you again for taking time for this. And uh, sure. thank you all for the chat room for some really wonderful conversations uh, from various people here. And, uh, and, and yes, yes, to, uh, yes, Tom's right. Mike Peters owns a great Superman costume. Thank you, Phil Geiger. Thank you. Uh, David Wasserman, thank you, Scott Edelman, thank you, Thad Boyd, uh, thank you, uh, um, uh, Holly Buchanan, um, and everybody else who I'm seeing. Thanks, Joe. Uh, let me see some of the people that I didn't, I never called on. I'm sorry, we didn't get to everybody here. Um, you know, you're self-conscious knowing all those people are out there. Well, you know, you're you're popular. Kurt, they, they like you. We'll have you back one of these days when I make the second round of people. <laughs> these, and maybe by that time you'll be able to announce stuff about Astro City. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night and uh, stay cool.